So good to see you here. I just want to uh, do a brief introduction. My name, uh, first of all, is Paul Nitter. I teach here at Union, kind of in the area of uh, interreligious engagement, as we call it. I'm trying to promote greater understanding between our, our students here at Union, who are primarily Christian, to, to help them to understand other religions, uh, be ready to engage other religions. And so uh, I, together with the uh, Union Interfaith Caucus of Students, are part of the sponsoring spirit behind this event, because this is exactly the kind of, of, of activities that we, we want to have more and more of, conversations, in this case, between two leading Buddhist uh, teachers and scholars. Um, I am, let me just get a little personal, I'm especially delighted to welcome Mama Surya Das um, to Union. This is uh, something we talked about, I don't know if you remember, sorry, back at Garrison. I was on retreat with him at Garrison Institute in Hudson back in 2008, and we talked about his coming to visit Union, and yes, we wanted to, and this and that, that and away, and what well, we finally have, have realized. So uh, just, just delighted. But more personally, I am so happy and so proud because of what is on this little little uh, uh, frame, in this frame that I have in my office, which reads, um, Dogen Center and Lama Surya Das acknowledge that Paul Nitter has taken refuge in the Bodhisattva vow with Lama Surya Das during intensive retreat at Garrison, New York, um, July 2008, signed Lama Surya Das. And I got, you gave me the name, uh, Urgyan Menla Lotus Eater. So uh, I teach her is here today, and I'm so happy to have you. And, and, and yes, what an extraordinary teacher he is. Uh, the, the Dalai Lama has called him the, uh, the American Lama. He, he has an extraordinary ability to communicate sometimes the complexities of, of Buddhist teaching and Buddhist practice in ways that are, are not only clear, but engaging. And I know that from, from experience. Um, He's the author of numerous books. I think one of, one of the earlier ones, I don't know how far back it is, that really did well, Awakening the Buddha Within, um, one of his many uh, uh, bestsellers, about 12, 13 books. His most recent is the Tibetan, uh, um, Buddhist, Buddha Standard Time, Awakening to the Infinite Possibilities of Now. Um, he does have a blog called Ask the Lama. Um, just do a Google for it and you'll find it. Um, we are really honored, honored, deeply honored, and excited about having you here. Father Michael Holleran, um, I can't say an old, old friend, we met when I came to New York about six years ago, um, comes with his own particular qualifications. Um, he was educated by the Jesuit. What, he went to the Jesuit high school here? Yeah, Regis High School. Regis High School. Um, was a Jesuit uh, for about five years when he realized that, um, I, guess, I guess it was the Jesuits really weren't doing it for you, so um, <laughs> um, he became a Carthusian monk for 22 years. First in, uh, in Vermont and then in the Grand, Grand Chartreuse in France. Um, that was the topic of the very well-known uh, uh, film, in into, into Great Silence. Um, so um, he returned to New York in 94, and uh, in 2000, and, and worked as a parish priest here in, in Manhattan and the Bronx. And then um, in 2009, two things happened. You were, we Catholics call it, incarnated. You were, you were, um, enlisted as a priest of the Archdiocese of, of New York, but also he became a Senzai teacher in the Soto Zen tradition. So he is a qualified Zen teacher, um, having been uh, certified by uh, Roshi Father Robert Kennedy. Um, so both individuals are steeped in their own traditions, both individuals are acquainted with the other tradition, and both are going to address the topic 
um, of life after death. What might, what might come at that moment when we did farewell. So I think what we'll do, uh, the, the program is you'll both uh, open with some of your own statements and then mix it up a little bit with yourselves and then we'll, we'll open it up to conversation with everyone. Okay? So, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Professor. Should we shake hands before the fight starts? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you are old friends. <laughs> New friends, too. Uh, we decided, well, I didn't say, we didn't say life after death, oh, oh, oh. Pur purposely because life doesn't start after death. And eternal life doesn't start after death, it starts now, so, which is one of my main points, uh, even in Christianity, especially. So, uh, so we call it death and beyond, beyond not having a local meaning, but of course, rather, uh, you know, a spiritual meaning, uh, a, psych a conscious psychological meaning. Yeah. Uh, death and beyond. So, if you saw what we uh, put on the on the website, you'll see that first of all, we're not come doing this from an academic point of view. Uh, neither of us is an academic, for better or for worse. Uh, uh, we're practitioners, and we have hopefully the, the passion of the practitioner. And what we share, I think, will be primarily not not primarily the result of, of an intellectual speculation, but that goes with the passion as part of you know what we do for ourselves and others. But uh, uh, it comes from our experience and from what we've uh, learned from our own practice. And, and then the questions that come up and the insights that, that, that emerge uh, are from that as well. And, and so as all things living, uh, it's not settled. It's open to possibility. It's uh, exploring. We call it an exploratory conversation. Our own lives are explorations. Your own lives, hopefully, are explorations. Uh, and so in that spirit, we're willing to entertain perhaps some wild ideas or wild possibilities, uh, with, and comfortable with it's not being resolved, or even, in most cases, resolvable, because who has been back from there? Uh, it depends where there is. Yeah, well, yeah. And if, if we're really there, if we're really there, we never leave it, and we never come back. So we don't have to come back, we're just here already, anyway. Um, all right. Yeah. <laughs> But that's my first point, and I think Lama Surya in his suggested blurb that we put on, on the website said, well, when do we die? How do we die? Who dies? You know, what are we talking about? And then that wonderful phrase, he quoted as being from a Sufi mystic, but I've heard it from so many sources, I don't know who originated it, is, if you die before you die, then you won't die when you die, or something like that. But if you die before you, if you die mystically before you die physically, then when you die physically, it's not really death. Which, Jesus actually said, when he's speaking to Mary and Martha, you know, at the death of their brother Lazarus, he said, whoever is alive, if you translate it rightly, whoever is alive by believing in me can never die, because you're already alive. And when Martha goes on to say, uh, oh, I know my brother will rise on the, the resurrection on the last day, putting it, eternal life out in the future somewhere, or usually up there somewhere, the way we imagine it, which is the problem. Um, he says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. I'm looking at you right here in the face uh, to remind her that, that that is now. That's what it's really all about. And this is, maybe the Buddhists had to come to remind me and remind other Christians of this truth who have tended to express eternal life in terms of a future life after we physically die or in terms of a heaven up there somewhere. And isn't it amazing if you actually examine how much of our Christian imagination from the scriptures onward has to do with you know the many tiered cosmos. You know, Jesus ascended into heaven, and we're going to go up to heaven. We even call it heaven. Time magazine called it heaven last week on the cover story. Uh, as Lama Surya reminded me, so I went out and bought it and read it. Um, and uh, or heaven, the the, the, uh, the you know hell is down there in the center of the earth. And some of my fellow monks, when I was a monk in France and America, believed that literally. So some of the people are still there. So the point is, uh, the real death uh, that we undergo, if this is Christian language, it's right there when Paul says you know, to the Romans on Easter Sunday, the reading we used on Easter Sunday, uh, you have died, we have been buried, and we have risen to newness of life. We've been raised up and we sit already with Christ in the heavenly places, as, we, as he says elsewhere. The whole emphasis uh, is on the fact of being risen 
die dead and risen now. Whereas Paul also says, uh, I die every day. So our, our real, real challenge in this life is to die, to rise to new life and to do it now, do it here, what's sometimes called realized eschatology in Christian theology, to being a little fancy phrase for something that should be very visceral and very immediate and very, uh, very everyday experience. Uh, so when do you ever hear anybody say, as St. Paul does, that we already sit with Christ in the heavenly places? We're already there. So it's obviously, in that sense, not a place at all, and this has been said very often in these days, it's absolutely true, it's not part of the geographical many-tiered universe. It's a state of consciousness, it's a state of being, it's a whole different change of mind, repentance, metanoia in Greek, which means getting beyond the mind, or past the mind, or change of mind. That's what it's all about. It's about a renewal of consciousness, a transformation of being through consciousness. Um, being and consciousness, which might end up being the same. Uh, when you get deep enough and high enough, or whatever you want to call it, get present enough, uh, that, that's, that's what it is. Uh, so, helped perhaps by that Buddhist sense, uh, the, especially the Zen sense of being here and now, and experiencing the eternal now, and Eckhart told us the power of now, the same, same idea, the, the ancient Christian philosophical view that eternity is not a, a life that lasts a long time, but the intensity of the simultaneous intensity of, uh, of an infinite life possessed now, which is God sharing God's light. Uh, that is a reality uh, which is absolutely Christian, absolutely scriptural, as I say. It's right here and now that we are risen, that we have died and that we rise. And we do it every day, transformed from glory to glory, as St. Paul said, being transformed into the fullness of the stature of Christ. Uh, and the other major thing about it is this is, who are we then in this case? Who are we really if we die this way and live this way? Uh, you never hear this preached either by Christian, uh, Christian uh, preachers who say, uh, we never hear it said, Christ will be all in all. Christ is everything and everywhere, everywhere, all the time. He is the fullness of the unit who fills the universe in all its parts, head of the body of the church. We are the body, the whole universe is the body of Christ in a real sense. If Christ is all in all, in other words, if Christ is the sole reality everywhere, all the time, in everything and everyone, what does that feel like? What is that you? What is that experience? Who are we then? St. Augustine said in the end, there will just be one Christ loving himself. It's kind of a startling way of putting it. But that our whole reality is Christ, transferred into Buddha nature or reality, ultimate nature, whatever you want to call it, our true self, our Christ self. And this, this is what is a reality, should become a reality more and more now, and just continue beyond the, the, the sparse veil, the, the thin veil of the physical death, to a, a coming into the fullness of the consciousness, the Christ consciousness, the universal consciousness, what they call the Buddha nature as well, uh, in, when we pass that thin veil. So physical death is a piece of cake. Uh, compared to the dead mystical death we have to. And so heaven, that state of consciousness, begins now, exists now, and has been well said, in that case it's heaven all the way to heaven, and hell all the way to hell, because you can go the other way too, to a different state of consciousness, as both these traditions clearly say. Uh, so it's not hell all the way to heaven, or heaven all the way to hell, you know, as many people think, it's on the contrary. Uh, and I would just say this, this is very much in the, from the Zen Buddhist tradition, this beautiful uh, koan uh, from the Lomokha, uh, the 7th, uh, it's called Tosetsu's Three Barriers. It says, right here and now, where is your true nature? And what is your true nature? It's asking you to wake up to that reality I've been talking about in Christian terms. But that's exactly the, I think, exactly what Zen is, is, is pointing to. And it says, if you do realize your true nature, then you're beyond life and death. Because you can't die and, you, and this is a whole new life. And uh, so when it says, when, it, when your, uh, the breath, when your eyes fade at the last moment, how you belong to life and death? Well, you can understand how. The reality that I've just been speaking of. And where do you go? The third part, the third barrier of the koan asks. Where do you go when, uh, when you have be, go beyond life and death? Uh, when, the, when the elements of your body dissolve? Well, you're here. You're now. You don't have to go anywhere. 
So I've, I've discovered, you know, in, in, in that Zen, the clear Zen emphasis on the that intensity of life, that eternal now, that being here, a recovery of, of some of the truths of St. Paul and of Christianity, which nobody ever talks about, because we imagine ourselves, our bodies, we can, are we constituted in our ordinary individual consciousness, and Sylvia knitted socks when she was down here, and so up there's going to be Sam Sylvia knitting socks as well, and it's insane, and who wants to do that? Yeah. So it, it, recovering, you know, the universal Christ consciousness that, that, we, that is our heritage is what we're talking about. And I'll, I'll say more about the physical aspect of the resurrection of the body and what that might mean and how that can be seen, I think, even in, in, in the Buddhist tradition, interpreted that way, uh, and what that might mean, uh, how we can better understand that in, in a Christian context, in this context, after I pass the mic to Sonia, or when he takes his own mic to say something on his own. I think we should have a Buddhist-like fifth equal amount of silence just to absorb and reflect upon all that has been transmitted and transpired here. Thank you, Roshi. Um, there's a lot to think about there. Buddha himself said that as in the jungle, the footprints of the elephant are by far the largest and deepest. In the jungle of spiritual practices and disciplines, the contemplation on death, impermanence, mortality is by far the largest, greatest, and the deepest. So, of course, death, mortality, and its relatable things are a timeless, evergreen subject. Of course, we're all interested in it. We're in some phase of ignoring or denial about it until something happens in our close circle, etc. But it doesn't mean it goes away. So the Buddha himself, who was a teacher, among a lot of things, an enlightened teacher, let's say a wise sage and teacher, encourages us to hold in the front forefront of our consciousness the fact that we will be here forever, that everything comes and goes and so forth, and to go deeper and to live, not just to die, because we're all going to die, but who's really going to live? Which segues back to what Father Michael has been talking about. Who shall really live? And who does live? And who dies? And the other aspects of this timeless koan, conundrum, existential riddle about death. And how to truly live, not just later, but now, not just in the afterlife, but after this moment, which is the true afterlife that we're already in, as you said so eloquently, always with Buddha, all Buddha, one Buddha, or maybe you said Christ, I get confused. Just the translation placeholder for something that's beyond the words and concepts. But I thought today, so just to, you know, to breathe a little and take all that in, and I love it when you talk dirty like that, when you tell me words like metanoia, <laughs> transformation, and so forth. Because I'm more, I'm more of a kind of a popularizer. I'm more for the positive spirituality, not just talking about death all the time and impermanence and sin and sacrifice and self-flagellation and original sin. I'm all for a positive spirituality, positive Buddhism, original goodness, the Buddha nature, and the joy and buoyance of spirit, even of getting together like this and talking about these things. I'm just joking. <laughs> it's also partly true. I think it's a very important today to enjoy and take joy in even this gathering and be grateful and, and you know, aliveness is here among us, whatever words we call it. Look at this wonderful gathering here and what we're doing together. This is a moment of life. This is the waters of life. This is enlivening, not enervating, deadening. And this is the holy now. It's now or never as always. That's the secret. Whatever words you put on it. 
The Christian mystics I heard call it the changing times and the unchanging time now. Buddhists call it the fourth time, past, present, and future, and now, now, now. That's eternal nowness. That's the timeless time, the deathless time, according to Buddhist teaching. The holy now that bisects vertically, vertically, ascending deepest time, that bisects vertically, every moment of horizontal, linear, conventional, changing times. The changeless times, as the Christian mystics call it. That we're always now. What we seek is right here. The problem is we're usually elsewhere than this now. Distracted, dissociated, living at a small distance from ourselves, like James Joyce's character, Bloom. So a lot of this is coming home to ourselves. So I'm really not the answer man. I'm more like the question man. So I'm listening to you and your, your wonderful Dharma transmission, your homily, your poem, really, your song of spirit and of deathless life. And I'm thinking, so if we're all with Jesus and, and in Buddha and everything, then why don't we know it? And why is it not preached more? You pull quotes out of, I won't say where, from St. Paul and St. Augustine, and I never hear these things. And I've read the Bible, and I wonder, are these coming from the Gnostic Gospels? Or these translations you've made yourself from those big old jars that they found in, in the desert of Brooklyn or wherever, somewhere, you know, not comedy over there by Brownsville or something. I get confused. It's just so wonderful. But why we don't hear about this more from the pulpits today? So these are kind of my kind of questions. Like, who dies? Now, originally I thought, you know, because I didn't really read the, the, the poster or the website or whatever you say that I wrote, you know. I mean, I wrote it, but I didn't read it, you know. I didn't decide to ever do it. So I wrote it and I sent it out. So I thought that, that today's subject was to, when we're all going to die. And so as a lava with my superpowers, I was going to, like, read your auras and tell you. Like, one by one. Oh, I see them heading for the door already. No, I don't have any superpowers. And I don't know. I'm joking, but I am going to take this up seriously. And I'll tell you when you're going to die. And when you die, and we've all died so many times already, whether you think of rebirth as life to life, or identity to identity as our roles shift through the decades of our life, or our roles in life, or our names, and, or, our, or moment to moment, as Buddhists like to think of it, every moment, breath of death, and a rebirth, which opens the door to total freedom here and now. One moment of total awareness is one moment of freedom and enlightenment, as we say in Tibetan. One moment of total awareness is one moment of freedom and enlightenment. So every moment is a rebirth and a resurrection. Why do we keep getting left back? So we have to repeat these habitual moments again and again in our present cell, fighting for a better birth on the Titanic, redecorating our present cell when the doors are open. So I'm going to tell you now when. You're going to die. I assume I have your attention now. Every moment that you forget yourself and your true nature is when you're going to die. You just did. And we do every moment that we forget ourselves. And when we're going to truly live is every moment that we remember ourselves with a capital S. If we're a Buddhist, our selfless selves, our Buddhists. If you're a Christian, you're Christos, the inner light. Quaker founder George Fox, if I remember correctly, doubtful, called it the inner light. This is not just Buddhist talk. The Dalai Lama calls it the inner clear light. This is universal reality. It's not light of the optic nerves or wattage. This deathless nature, true nature, natural mind, divine mind, whatever we call it. Mind with a capital M, as the Zen tradition calls it. Buddha mind, cosmic mind, divine mind with a capital M. Are you with me? Not just mind with a small m, conceptual, intellectual, separate, rational thinking mind. But spirit, consciousness, mind with a capital M, Buddha mind, divine mind, not intellect, not psychology. That's where we truly live. And when we come home to whom what we truly are, when we awaken, when we break through to that, break on through to the other side. Anybody old enough to remember the doors? and you really weren't there, as they say. No, break on through to this side. Rumi poet says, Sufi poet, 
I've been knocking on your door for so long, Lord. Wow, I've been knocking from inside. You know what I explained? I've been knocking on your door for so long trying to get in, but I've been knocking from inside. So it's very important to touch this deathless, timeless, true nature. Why, whatever name we call it is just the sweet. Now I know I can see some of you by your auras, not by your jewelry, by your, 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 your um, overly serious grimaces that you're Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> and Buddhists will, re will re recite today like a catechism. Buddha said, everything is impermanent, everything changes. Anybody hear that mantra? Buddha never said that. Buddha said, Anicca vata samkara upada sayidamano. He said, in Pali language, ancient Indian, he said, all conditioned things are impermanent. All put together things are impermanent. He gave a couple examples of something that are not impermanent. One was space, because it's not compounded, put together. It's not born, it doesn't die. And then more interestingly, he gave the example of nirvana. Nirvana consciousness, which is more to the point. He called it, are you ready, O changists, O believers that everything is impermanent? Buddha called it deathless nirvana. Now as a good Buddhist, Buddha, you know, he was in the Buddhist club, <laughs> joking. He didn't start Buddhism. He called his teaching the middle way. Buddha, as a good sage, he understood that people would grasp at and reify this. So he kept teaching to recognize everything is impermanent. You won't be disappointed in passing things. Well, it is born, dies, and so on. But deathless nirvana, that's a part of us too. We can tune into that. We have that in us, that deathlessness. But as a Buddhist, he didn't say eternal, because Buddhism is an Eastern religion that deals in non-affirming. So we say not two, we don't say oneness in Buddhism. We say non-duality, we don't say oneness in Buddhism. We say deathless, not eternal, because eternal suggests a thing that is eternal when everything is interconnected. There is no one separate thing. God or self, you know, according to this way of thinking, bigger process thinking interdependence, interconnectedness. Deathless nirvana, deathless true nature. That's my point here. Please try to break through to this side, your side. Turn the arrow of the search, turn the spotlight search would quote inward, not narcissistically, but just look deeper. It's in all of us. And not just human beings, all sentient beings endowed with this luminous Buddha nature deathless nirvana consciousness, to put it in very gross words. That's where we truly live. Every moment we forget that, that's when we're going to die. Each moment is a choice point. You choose. The more aware we are, the more we can choose. Every moment is a choice point. We can't get from here to there. Because there is not over there. We can't get from here to truly here, when we truly inhabit this radiant moment. Awareness is the Alpha and Omega in this kind of Gnostic, experiential Gnostic self-knowledge practice. So those are my thoughts. Of course, I could talk about Tibetan Buddhism and its special teachings of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Of course, there's an Egyptian Book of the Dead. If you're interested, look at chapter 10 of Tibetan Book of Living and Dying by Sogyal Rinpoche. It was a bestseller in the 90s. Chapter 10 is the essence of it. The innermost essence is called Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. There's a lot we can say about this from the Tibetan tradition. But it's all about awakening, enlightenment. Awakening after you die in that transition or bardo. Awakening after this moment in the transition before the next moment, before you were born again in your habitual patterns. Awakening in sleep and knowing you're dreaming while you're still asleep. Awakening during the daydream of this bardo, after birth, before death and so on. The Bardo teachings of Tibet Buddhism, and many other things we could talk about. The rainbow light of perfect transference, deathless nirvana, again, in the Buddhist tradition that stresses change and impermanence and no separate self. So I'm just throwing out a few provocations, and also I, I'm trying to uh, pass the buck back to Father Michael, because I love listening to him, and I'm sure you agree that there's really something very special here for us, a Catholic priest, deep, 
learned, who's also a Zen master. Now, I'm a fond, uh, fond professor, Paul Nitter, gave a very nice introduction to us. It was very flattering, but I had to say, if I was introducing also, I like to let other people do the work. You know, like Buddha said, not my will, but thine, O Buddha. Well, there's some great, uh, great things you say there about knocking on the, on the door. Uh, that reminds me of a couple of uh, Sufi things. Well, first of all, John of the Cross. Yeah. When, you, when you wake up to this reality, you want it to be uh, as full and as glorious as possible. Uh, uh, John of the Cross kept repeating, muero porque no muero. Uh, I die because I don't die. So, I die because I do not die. Yeah. He meant he wanted to physically die so that he can enter into the fullness of this, this, this uh, reality that he had encountered of what's called the mystical marriage. But I love the Sufi uh, story that I, I often recount, uh, which Rumi uh, mentions. Uh, talking about the Christ consciousness being your true self. Uh, uh, you had the seeker uh, coming out of the woods knocking on the hut of the master uh, at one point. He said, he knock, knock, knock. The master says, who's the who was there? A trick question, of course. Um, and the guy says, oh, that's me. Yeah, go back to the woods uh, and just keep meditating. Uh, so he comes back a year or two later, knocks on the door and says, who's there? You. So he'd been transformed. It wasn't me or I anymore. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about. We, we are the Christ consciousness. We become transformed into Jesus Christ, or our true nature, as we call it. I wanted to emphasize, though, also this. Uh, we're celebrating in, in Easter time, uh, you know, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And sometimes this seems to be put forth by Christians and Buddhists. Uh, it seems to be as, you know, a, a dividing line. That, that certainly in Greek and Platonic thought, there was no, 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 no openness to this. Um, but, uh, or even in, in, in Hebrew thought, uh, Originally, but that, there, that the body or some kind of bodily element, uh, the material creation, somehow participates in this fullness. You know? And I think this is very, 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 very important. Uh, the uh, Saint Paul again says to the Romans, you know, the whole world is groaning with labor pains, you know, waiting for the revelation of the children of God. So through our transformed consciousness, which then becomes reverberates to our transformed material bodies which then reverberates to the rest of material creation in and through the body of Jesus Christ. Um, the whole universe is transformed. That's what we mean by a new heavens and a new earth, uh, as Isaiah in the book of Revelation said. So that it's not just a new heavens, a new consciousness, you know, but a new earth, a new body, or all of the body of Christ. Um, as Roshi Kennedy has said, you know, the mountains, the hills, the, the rivers are the body of Christ. Uh, uh, extension of the Eucharist, if you will. And then we are also the body of Christ. So we are the mountains and the rivers you know, as, as, as the Zen would also say very clearly. So uh, there is this strong sense of the inclusion of what we call matter, and the bodily element here. But I think the very fact that in Buddhism, for example, there's no distinction between, there's not this nefarious distinction between natural and supernatural, nor even the distinction between spirit and matter. Matter is just light energy, as even physics reminds us, it's just light energy calcified, you know, con con conglomerated. Uh, that's why this is the power in the atom, there's huge energy, you know, when matter is congealed that way. But it's, it's all connected, it's all in reality. Um, so that, it's, that it is all, uh, all included. Uh, so that uh, because, of, because of that emphasis, uh, we can at one of the time, one of the, at the same time say, uh, this is a reminder to us of our own tradition, the fact that there is just one creation, just one reflection of God, which then returns to God and is transformed back into God through Christ and the Spirit. But also a reminder, that's really what Zen is talking about. Matter is, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, the relative and the absolute form, one non-dual, as he said very well, non-dual reality. Um, so that uh, the inclusion of the physical cosmos in this transformation of consciousness in some way, which is mysterious and still in process, it would seem, or yet in the now, fully realized, perhaps somehow. Um, that, that is what we're talking about in, in, in either tradition. Uh, and uh, I'd like to point out, too, that one of the, one of the ways I think the, the Buddhists, the Mahayana tradition, sees the, the resurrection, or could see the resurrection of the different bodies of the Buddha, they speak of the different kayas, 
in your manakaya being like the incarnation, the physical, existent, uh, 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 temporal being, the Siddhartha, you know, of, of Shashakamuni Buddha, but then the, uh, the Dharmakaya being the, the, the absolute from which it comes, you could say, the Son of God, Self, the Trinity. And then, but it also says, speaks about the Sambhogakaya, which is, which is called the enjoyment body, the luminous body, the transformation body, which we can become, and which we could call the resurrected body of Christ. Uh, I think fits in uh, beautifully to that, that notion of the different levels of reality and of transformation, how they're all connected and emanate from each other and then return to the source, um, I think is very, is very beautiful. Um, so I did want to emphasize the inclusion of the whole physical universe in and through the, the, you know, the body, whether you call it the body of the Buddha or the body of Christ, uh, uh, that, uh, and that it is, includes the whole universe uh, and is there. It ties in, by the way, to bring it back to Christian theology, to something Karl Rahner said, postulated when he spoke about death, his famous book on, on death back in the 50s, early 60s. He said, uh, he speculated that, you know, because of who we are, that we are body and spirit together, according to good old Aristotelian philosophy, which the church adopted, felicitously in this case. Um, there can't be any separated soul after death. We can argue about whether this is, we should visit it as the soul at all. I don't think it's necessarily the best way of doing it, but that's what we've done. Uh, it cannot exist without the bodily relationship, a relationship to the material universe. So he suggested, well, maybe at that point, right after death, physical death, the whole universe is our body. Which is exactly what we're talking about here. The whole universe is the body of Christ. And once again, it comes down to, what does that feel like? Wow. Imagine that. To have that whole pulsating physical vigor of spiritual consciousness and energy and life and love pulsating through the whole universe is your body. Wow. So what does that feel like? You should know, right? You should tell you first. <laughs> Well, it's very intense and it's very peaceful, though. All right, so far as we, 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 we have our, our initial taste of what it's like, you know, we, 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 but it is, it is very real. And, and then the Indians, the Hindus are into this with the chakras and all the interconnected energy, so energy centers. That's this. And the Kabbalists, how all these energy centers are in the body and in the whole universe and the angelic universe and then the divine emanations and all of that, they're all interconnected. And it's all speaking about this unified, unified universe where this basically the same uh, energy, uh, exchanges going on, however you name them, on all different levels, um, into one universe, one consciousness, which goes back into what we call God, or Buddha nature. Um, and this is eternal life, this is heaven, this is now. It's, uh, and somehow, that is the, uh, the transformation, the, the new heavens and the new earth. And I think, and I think people like Eckhart Tolle and, you know, suggest this as well, the second coming of Christ and the transformation of the universe and the end of the world is when everyone wakes up and experiences this. Somehow that's the key. Not in some imagined coming on some imagined cloud at some point in the sky by, you know, a physically visible son of man. That, those are all images, and please, let me make that point clearly right now. All our imagery about the afterlife is imagery! We're not going to be standing in a crowd waving palm branches, wearing white robes, and singing hallelujah for 300 years. <laughs> and when Jesus says, you know, the, 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 the poor man was in the bosom of Abraham with a big cat, come on, these, these are images. But we've taken them so literally. You know, I often like to say, you know, Buddhism imagines different hells and heavens that are not eternal, which I think we can also learn from, by the way, in both those cases. But I think the heavens that's described, you know, if people actually probably do go there to those pure lands or those heavens where you're just standing around singing hymns for 300 years and you think you're in heaven. Then you finally find out it's purgatory. <laughs> you see what I mean? The, the different levels of conscious awareness, we have to keep waking up and waking up and waking up and going beyond. Uh, and certainly what we have to get beyond are those images uh, to what they're pointing to. And all, all language is symbolic, and especially all religious language. So please, please, please don't take it literally. Um, we make ourselves a laughing stock for the culture if we do that. Uh, and we won't, we'll miss the path if we do that as well. And finally, just before I throw it back to you, uh, 
Lama Surya Das did me the great favor of pointing out something called the rainbow body in the Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition, uh, which a couple of Catholics actually, David Steinbel Rast, who we mentioned a moment ago, and, and uh, another priest whom I've met, Francis Tiso, uh, have been studying, where there seems to be a phenomenon, attested at least by the people uh, you know, around them, of the great Tibetan masters actually resolving after their physical death into light, rainbow actually visible in, in the sky, um, perhaps as a symbolic element too. But the sense that the body, you know, is when it's been purified and energized and su subtilized by this, uh, actually uh, it becomes like a light being, which I think could well be a way we could understand the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, that That is the kind of resurrected body we have. You know, it's, it's not the same as before. It's a being of great light. Why does nobody ever preach on the 15th chapter of Corinthians where St. Paul describes the, the, the characteristics of the risen body? It's immortal. It's glorious. It's lightsome. It can, it's agile. It can travel from spot to spot like that. It's uh, not like we know now. It's, in other words, it behaves like light and energy. Which is what I'm saying. It was what physics reminds us of. Which is what the universal and interconnectedness of all things remind us of. It's all connected energy at different levels of disability and density and uh, all this I think is a wonderful way to understand what, what the new heavens and the new earth are, can be, and how they're connected to consciousness and what the resurrected body of Jesus and ours is. And just remember it's all one body of Christ and all just Christ's consciousness. What does that feel like? Well, as Lama said, find out for yourself. Wake up. But I think these are fascinating perspectives. Maybe you want to say a little more about that Tibetan tradition or something else you want to talk about. Well, I'm just savoring what we're sharing here tonight, all of us together in the space of co-creating. Um, yes, the rainbow light body of full enlightenment, as they call it in Tibetan, is very much symbolic and imagery and metaphor because but on you know, the outer way, it's considered to be like light and rainbow, and you can see it, and it's less solid than the physical body. But in the inner way, it's about the entire spectrum of consciousness, from the beginning of evolution, or the lowest creature, the cell, or the protozoan, or, you know, I don't know, my in-laws, or whatever. <laughs> oh, it's choking. All the way up, you know, to whatever you consider the highest level of creation is the enlightened ones, the saints, God, the cosmos, the universal consciousness, the source. Um, but at the deepest level, it's everything. So it's like breaking the jar and the air returning to the sky. The air was never separate from the sky when it was inside the jar. But when, you bring, when the physical discorporates, when the clay of this body goes back to the earth in which it comes, you know, the, what was within, which is inseparable from without all law, returns like the bubble to the sea from which it's never been apart. So when you see through your illusory separate self, you don't really have to slay the ego. That is ego death. You see that you don't have to get rid of the ego. You can learn more lightly that the bubble has seen the sea and didn't see it. Are you with me? The bubble is in the sea. It's nothing but sea. And yet it's a separate and distinct bubble at the same time. So when we hear things like slay the ego or ego death, it sounds scary. But who is it scary to, friends? Only one person, one person only. The ego. When the ego realizes its nature is the sea, it doesn't have to pop to return to the seaness to see through its illusory separateness. And then you can bob along with your own hairdo and your own way of life and your own religion or whatever. <laughs> Bobbing along, no problem. So um, that reminds me of a Zen poem. Um, I know you're the Zen master, but I, I also dabble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the forest dove of the Dharma. I've done it with all the teachers. I mean, spiritual speaking. <laughs> I've always been there. So I lived in Kyoto, Japan for one year when I was in Asia in the 70s and 80s, and I studied Zen and etc. I remember one of the Japanese death poems, which is a genre of Japanese art and Buddhism, which I recommend to you if you're interested in this subject. Very short death poems, masters left behind in their last <coughs> words, a, a death poem, a haiku. 
there were whole collections of them. And one of them was, in the sea of life, in the sea of death, I have found the mountain from which the waters have receded. This is the deathless that we're talking about. In the sea of life, and in the roiling, let me reinterpret, embellish, let me translate. In the roiling and boiling sea of life, in the roiling and boil, boiling and uncertain sea of death, I found the mountain, the refuge, from which the waters have receded. You see, there's a notion of transcendence, of being above it all, of the high ground. We can, in the high ground is not the Himalayas or the Holy Land or Mount Shasta. We can assume the high ground with Him. That's the real high ground. That's the inner Tibet. The high ground with Him. Uh, I trust you know what I'm talking about. So I found this um, kind of teaching about the deathless rainbow body and other things. It's a good balance to that sort of almost pessimistic, as the previous Pope called in his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, about putting down Buddhism in the whole chapter about Buddha, uh, mistakenly calling him pessimistic about things like this, about suffering and death and you know universal truths like that. And in positive Buddhism, we see there is a, the great joy and the deathless and the freedom and the nowness and the accessibility and the great democratic egalitarianism that we're all Buddhas by nature, not Buddhists. As it says in the Tibetan text, we're all Buddhas by nature. We only have to recognize who and what we truly are. It's only temporary obscurations which veil that fact. That is an unbelievable radical egalitarian war cry from ancient times, 2,500 years ago. 2,400 years before this, you know, we had the civil rights movement in this country and women and slaves were freed, not quite, and so on. 2,500 years ago. Unbelievable, just coming out of an inner realization of reaching the common ground. So what I, I call this original goodness. I've coined this term, think about it. Original goodness. I leave it to you to think about whether this is saying different or related to the Christian notion that I occasionally hear about, don't quite get, of original sin. I'm not a big believer in original sin. I try to read about it. I'd like your comment on this. I try to read about it. Here's my point. It's not original sin. Even in the basic exoteric story, the garden is the original goodness that we fell from. We can get home to ourselves, to the inner garden. That's the high ground within. Am I going too fast? Original sin is the secondary. The apple, the tree of knowledge, the dualism of good and evil, the separateness of body and mind, heaven and earth. That's not original. That's penultimate. The ultimate original is the garden itself. Anyway, maybe now I'm talking Buddhism and co-opting Christian theology. I, I don't want to do that. I beg your forgiveness. <laughs> yeah, Hoi ve is me. Gotten Himmel, as my grandmother would say. Gotten Himmel, yeah. yeah. Uh, we don't want to get, uh, spend a lot of time talking about too much original sin, but it is important to... Uh, hey, original, original goodness. The goodness is original. That's strict Catholic theology as well, the garden. And I very much agree with your interpretation of the ego and the duality and the creation of separateness and alienation. That's really the essence of original sin. I also think the other part of it, from an evolutionary point of view, is all this pure Darwinian aggress aggressivity, you know, and power and passion, uh, which is so centered on the individual uh, that has to be transformed, like the serpent at the base of the spine that comes up in Kundalini and has to be spiritualized and, and, and transformed. Uh, so both Buddhism and Christianity speak about that state of, of suffering, of alienation, of ego, of grasping, uh, which, from which we have to be healed and transformed. So I think there's basic agreement there. I see it is hot in here, and I'm, most of you are, are, are falling asleep or are nodding off. Uh, I'm only seeing, I'm only, I'm only, I'm, I'm only observing what. I, uh, maybe not all, most of them. So I, I want to... observing yourself? Yes, yes, that's right. I should focus on that. Okay. <laughs> what else can I focus on? Uh, but maybe it's a good time to open it up for... Uh, for yes, that would be good. Also, um, Paul Knitter, I'd like to invite you to make in some comments before the question. Or if you have any questions. Or questions. Yeah. Would you like to, since you're here? And there's a, yeah. I could even get you a chair. Would you like to my because I know you've thought about this, you have a lot to say. I'd like to hear from you. Okay. 
Well, I, I, yeah, I, I would like to join the conversation, but I think first of all, let's, let's, uh, let's hear from some of you, and uh, maybe in that context we can, we can engage each other, but I'm sure there's people here who might have questions or, or comments to make, and we want to uh, give you an opportunity to raise whatever you'd like. To. Don't be afraid to put us on the spot. <coughs> so, um, yes. Is there? Okay. Have, um, the mic for them. This mic is isn't working on those if you can have it. <coughs> and um, we'll clear those. I don't know how much we have. Oh, yeah, there's one. Yeah, if you can come up. Oh, no, that's it. Well, why don't you just um, on up and speak to mic so everybody can hear you. My name is Karen Byrne. I'm a 2007 graduate of Union. Oh, yes. I had dinner the other night with a man whose wife died recently, and he would describe himself as a secularist. He's keenly interested in my journey and um, wanted to talk with me about the death of his wife. It struck me that there's two realities. And the risk of sounding hopelessly dualistic. I think there is the survivor's understanding, their own experience, and the best of our understanding about what happens to the dead. He said, I'm not concerned about where she is. She was a great gardener and a humanist and a very dynamic, loving person, not a faithful person. She didn't claim any spirituality outside of her garden and her family. He said, I'm less concerned about where, where she is than my sense that she's gone. Yes, that of course is a, a, a great question and we all have to deal with loss and change in our lives. Many have said that the world religions have arisen uh, exactly to deal with that question, that people began to look for something more than themselves to deal with death. Uh, be that as it may, I think how it comes to us is very important to, to look at experience that and to keep it real. So um, I think there's a lot in what we're saying that may sound mystical, but I think it's also quite practical you know, to live in the moment. Uh, for example, I mean, I'm talking to you, not your friend, so you know, for oneself, for each of us to be in the moment with that reality of loss, of change, and that that's part of life. And that's very important. I know it sounds cliche, but, but now let me uh, talk personally. My father, I grew up in Long Island. I'm Jewish on my parents' side, as I always say. i a Buddhist by choice and inclination. My father died at Mount Sinai of cancer about 15 years ago. The hospital, so I was there alone with him at 7 in the morning, and the family had been going back and forth to Long Island every day, but as I live in Massachusetts, I was staying at a hotel nearby so I could be there all the time. So I was alone with him. And he died in his sleep and I just sat with him and it was one of the best times we ever had together for 45 or 50 minutes. Kind of counterintuitively, I didn't have a plan for this. Just being with him before the nurse came and said he was dead and they started doing what they do, which is a bit of a ruckus. But that 45 or 50 minutes, it was, it was so profound. Was he there or not there? And where did that leave me? You know, it's always about me. What about me? And so forth. And it was so profound. It was beyond. I was just so grateful that I could be there with him. And it really wasn't about me. And it was very, very instructive. And in a way, a piece of a separate me died also at that time. And so much of our concerns are about me, myself, and I. What about me? And I think when we look deeply into this, we might see a little bit of us can go and let go and we could even appreciate even the sadness and pain because it's a form of the love 
There's a big difference between sadness and despair and depression. It's a spectrum, it's a slippery slope. So it was sad, but it was also beautiful when he died peacefully and we could be together and I repaid him for his many years of bringing me up. He was always there for me and I was there for him. And I'm kind of like the rabbi of the family, they say. So you know, I was there for him and that was beautiful. Yeah, and I, I would say too, uh, obviously when you experience this uh, universal consciousness in both Christianity and Buddhism, mind is that it is intrinsically compassion. Not even compassion, that it's compassion itself. Uh, so to be with and to, to share, uh, uh, weep with those who weep and laugh with those who laugh, as St. Paul says, uh, that, that's, that's the sign of an awakened person, to be able to really be pastoral, to be human, to be to company. Uh, one another in that. Uh, as Richard Rohr says too, it's these big questions of love, and death, and infinity, God, suffering, uh, that you don't have answers for, that you really have to just be, as, as Lama was saying, just be, to be present, so he's saying be present right there in the moment with yourself and with, with the other person. But there, and I, I come up with these situations all the time as a Catholic priest, I'm with people in their funeral homes and, and funerals and so on. Um, but I do also try to wake them up to well, start to maybe wake them up to the, what, what, do you, what, what, can you, what can you learn from this? If you're really present to it, can you open up to a deeper reality which is already present, you know, that's uplift, uplifting you and, and the deceased person and, and, and the whole universe? Uh, that there is, uh, there, is a, there is a presence and a, and a reality beyond. The reality of love, for example. Remind them that the experience of love that they had, had touched was, was touched with, uh, with eternity was touched with uh, something that could not die. Whatever is truly real can never die. As Eckhart Tolle said so well. Uh, so, so maybe to encourage them, you know, to, what more are you perceiving here now? What more is there that can lift you up? And just to share also my own experience with my two parents and also my mother's sister, who was a nun who died, uh, all of cancer, all fairly quickly. Each one of them was indescribably radiant, so eager to move on, to let go. It was unbelievably peaceful in all three cases. And, and so in those cases, it's hard, to, <laughs> it's hard to feel like you've lost something because they were so wonderfully radiant. But that's perhaps not, that's not everyone's experience. Um, so yes, to be pastorally present, but perhaps to use that moment to encourage the person to use that moment to, to discover a, something deeper, which is in germ right there, in the present right there, uh, which is not, doesn't die. Just to throw a little clink in that nice warm furry. Um, family just went through a very traumatic death. Yeah. Um, and I've also worked with cancer patients aside from that, and they're not all nice and peaceful, no. quiet, die and asleep. Um, personally, death it's not a big deal. I've had fully conscious out-of-body experiences and some things like that. But um, the getting there doesn't thrill me a whole lot. <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious as to your point of view about right to die. Right to die. Um, do you want to say something? No, you go ahead. No, I'll, I'll say something. I will, I will say something about you. Well, yielding to greater wisdom. I know, but you'll talk to her about humans and so on, and I'm going to bring in the Buddhist view about animals and beings, and it gets complicated. Well, you know, putting down pets and other things. Uh, oh, well, that is. <coughs> well, my, my, uh, my personal view, as I think I just intimated by, you know, talking about the experience of, of, of Dying and what we go through so many times. Is, uh, don't get rid of suffering before you learn what it has to teach you. Sure, we want to avoid suffering as much as possible and the indignities and being a burden to others. And uh, and I can I very much respect, uh, although I don't agree with, but necessarily the, the, those who who want to end their lives at a particular moment. Uh, I'm not going. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't judge them in any way. But I, I personally think that, it, that, that there's it, it, part of the whole drama is just to, to go the whole way, you know, whatever it is. Uh, uh, modern medicine makes it more complicated. And certainly, certainly, I don't think people should prolong life unnaturally with all sorts of tubes. And, and, and all that's, that's not doing anybody any good. Uh, 
uh, and there's no obligation in Catholic theology to do that at all. Um, but to be as passionately present in, and as humanly present as possible in the midst of, the, of that drama. You know. uh, certainly Jesus didn't.